Well, hello everyone. Uh, today I'm gonna have Jose Giras joining me. Um, so Jose is a former coach of Jim Courier, Roger Federer, um, former um, director of coaching at the USTA, um, for a friend and my mentor, among the other the other things. So uh, this talk we're gonna. Uh, we decided with Jose we're gonna do it in in, in English. Uh, so I see Jose there. So I'm gonna ask for his. Uh, I'm gonna wait for his request, and we're gonna be live here. All right, waiting for Jose to get on, and then here we are. Okay. How are you? Good. How, how are you, Diego? Very good. Very good. On a rainy day here in Florida, so uh, just just having some some rest. But um, but it's a good time to be at home right now today. Uh, just resting and, and talking tennis with you. I say I'm so happy, so excited to have you with me. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Diego. And uh, just want to say hi to everybody, and I hope everybody is doing well and uh, and safe. And these times will come, and they will be a lot better. So thank you for having me. Yeah. So Jose. Um, so first, one of the things that I want to mention, um, you, I consider you not only my friend but my mentor. So it's a, you know, it's a pleasure to, for me to talk to you, and and always that I can pick up your brains. Um, you want, and, and I'm gonna say that once at the beginning of the talk, and then we're gonna dive into into tennis. Yes. But um, as as my, we we work together. We we did a lot of few work together, but. When you was my boss, one of the one of the main thing that I really appreciate was uh, as a leader, um, the 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 time that you or the moment that we could, I you let me disagree with you or not not disagree but uh, express certain things that I wanted to, and you was always open not only to to listen to me but giving me your answer and and talking about everything that we all, always talk. So so that that was. Uh, because we're gonna we're gonna go over some leadership thing, and I want to mention that. So, um, as many things, as many things that I have good from you, one of the, the stood to me is is that 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 uh, that skill of listen to me and let me let me uh, express myself, and then and then go over and and talk and and teach me uh, how to how to do a better a better job, be a better coach, a better person. So, thank you. Thank you. Jose, uh, <clears throat> we're gonna go over your your philosophy first. I have a couple of questions that I wanna dig in uh, on on few things about your philosophy. Then we're gonna talk about uh, the Jose uh, coach working with with players. Obviously, uh, I have some question about about you working with Tim Courier, you working with uh, with Roger Federer, and and. Um, as your job with, with several other players like Pete Sampras and, and uh, among other players. Um, and then I'm gonna pick up your brains about, about other stuff in tennis. Um, so the first one is, one of the, the main thing for me about, about you is that uh, your, your coaching philosophy uh, is so, so precise, so simple, but, but I mean, right, spot on on, on everything. So the first question is, is how, how you come across about your own philosophy? When you was a player, when, when you start thinking about this is a, my principle, this is, this is the way that I want to coach? Well, when, when I think about how I go about, uh, about what I do about, about coaching and teaching, uh, there, are three, there are three aspects on that. The first one, I had a great influence. I had three, three big influences, two especially. Uh, the first one was when I was a kid, there was a, a teacher in Barcelona that I mentioned that quite a few times, uh, being the best teacher I've ever seen with, uh, with kids. And he was very interesting because uh, he would um, just work with you until you were 16 or 17. And after that, he would just let you go to somebody else. Um, so I learned a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, parameters, and a, a lot of, uh, of uh, being organized about the engagement of the, ki of, of the kids at young ages about the progressions on how you teach and so on. So that was a great uh, teaching experience for me. And that's what I got a lot of the things that I actually try to convey to the, to the kids when they're young. Another big influence on, on, uh, 
on how I do what I do is uh, are the, the all Australian players. I used to I used to bowl with for them, for the like, likes of uh, Labour and Roswell and Emerson, all those guys. I used to bowl with when I was uh, between nine and fourteen. Uh, so um, I love to watch them practice, and it always struck me <clears throat> the simplicity of their practices. They were always pretty physical, even if the, even if they were uh, running side to side. Uh, they were very. Um, they were. There was always an objective on the on the on what they were doing. But the physicality, uh, and we get into that a little more afterward. But the physicality um, and the and, and the objective of, of what they were doing. They used to play a lot of times. I remember Roswell doing that, putting a putting a can in one corner and going and and, and going to hit the can. And that's why actually I prefer cans than than cones, just yes, because the sound when you hit it is pretty fun. And so they used to do a lot of things like that. And, and the other thing that really, uh, that, that really got from them was uh, their, uh, their respect for the game and the love for the game. That is something that, um, that I always hold dear uh, when, whenever I, uh, I'm on the tennis court, is, uh, is to respect the game. And that's something that they, that they show pretty much all the time. So those are the three, those are the two. And then the other one, obviously, was my, my playing experience. So once uh, I played professionally for about 13 or 14 years, so once I decided to start coaching, uh, I got I put all those things together, and then and then I put my own my own little things how how I thought it could work better according to all those experiences that I had. But uh, but I was lucky enough to actually be in situations where uh, where I was uh, where I was taught a lot even without me knowing. So so those three things are are pretty much where I got the ideas of of, of teaching you know to young kids or uh, or coaching pro players. Perfect. Very, very clear. And now I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to dig in on, on certain things that I love about about things that we already talked. But, but I want to dig in more. I have one hour with you, so so I'm gonna enjoy yes. this. Yes. Um, one of the the points about uh, that teaching uh, hand, feet, and eyes and mind. Right. I love that. Can you can you can you go over that? I, obviously, the hand are related to the technique. Uh, young ages, I think, is the most important. The feet, like you say, is always there. The full work and eyes and mind. How how uh, how you see that? How you work on that? Well, I, I think I think when you when you watch a, uh, when a rally is in progress, when the ball is in play, uh, the way I see the game the game played. Um, is you play with your, you, you see the ball coming at you, you recognize the ball, uh, you decide what to do, right? So, 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 so you see it, which is the eyes and mind. Um, you decide what to do, which is, uh, which is basically where you're gonna stand on the court according to your shot. And then, and then you decide. So, so, uh, and, which you go with the football. So basically, basically, if you put those three things together, when you look at top players, uh, in, in a lot of cases, or most of the cases, that what separates them from, from one another. Is how, how well they move, how well a balance. I, I base everything on, 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 if you ask me what is the most important thing in tennis, I would say footwork and balance. With good footwork and, and good balance, that allows you to actually hit the shots that, that, that you learn to, to maximize in their, uh, their potential. The, the, the more you lack in, in one of those areas, together with the recognition, obviously, uh, the, the more your shots are going to fluctuate uh, up and down. So, so basically, um, so basically that, that's at a grand scale, that's how, that's how I see tennis. It's also, I think, um, I think it's a great tool to, uh, to scout. If I'm, if I'm scouting players, I pay attention to that. Uh, what, do they have good, do they recognize the shows? Well, if somebody do, doesn't have very good recognition, I'm not, not going to worry too much about playing sometimes a little shorter. Or if I get really stretched, uh, the, the player coming forward, or um, yes, things like that. That I always, I think that it serves you well uh, if, if you actually have a, uh, a something that you base how you how you watch tennis. And, and the other thing that I, that I like to say is that is obviously uh, there is no one way to do it. I mean, that's uh, there's a lot of people very very successful out there, a lot more than me, and uh, and. Um, and everybody does it their own way, but I think the game, I don't think the game is playing much different than that. So those are the, normally what I look and how I try to, to, uh, to convey the information that I convey to the players normally in those, um, in those, um, in those areas. And together with that, um, if you go to the teaching part, um, then, you start, then, you, then you, know, you start with the, uh, with the parameters you know, of, the, of the players, parameters on the, on, the, on the strokes, parameters on the movement, 
And, uh, and then how you progress to that, how you actually try to facilitate the teaching process uh, to the student to actually uh, give him a chance or her a chance to actually, to actually learn. Once again, there is no one way to do it. I've seen, I've seen different ways that, that have worked. That's normally how I feel that, that the player, um, um, with that, uh, with that um, uh, progressive teaching, I think it's a, it's a pretty safe way to do it. And once again, it gives the player a, a chance to actually, to actually keep learning. Perfect. And, and I'm going to go to the next one and come back to how, how you work on that. But the, the, other, the other thing that, that I love on, on things that we work together with is, is the seven steps. Um, so you, you just mentioned a few of those. So you recognize you hit the ball. You recognize what you did with the ball. Uh, you take advantage. Uh, then you decide. You see the, the, the player hit the ball. You decide. And from there, you start the physicality, which is the footwork, the adjustment, the step, and then the execution. Um, can you, that, that's a great, uh, for, me, for me, the seven steps are, are like amazing tool. Uh, can you explain a little bit how you see that from your perspective? And, and then the second question related to that is how you work again on the eyes and mind, how you, Pepe, work on that eyes and mind, because it's a, it's a, for me, it's, it's one of the, key of, of the tennis players? Yeah, obviously, uh, I mean, from my perspective, everything starts with the recognition. The better your recognition, uh, the better idea you have what comes afterwards. So, so the, better, the, the better you recognize what comes, what you hit, the, the, the better idea you have what, what can come. Doesn't mean it's going to come, but then, then, then that's how you position yourself. And, and, then, um, and then you take advantage of that situation. And, and advantage doesn't mean offensive all the time. Advantage maybe can be a hit a pretty good shot and take a pretty good um, position on the court, close to the baseline, but the, the other player counters better. So, so I take advantage by actually going diagonally back and respecting that power for, that, that's come from the other side. So, so once, that, and that happens so, so quick. So, so once, once, I, um, once I take advantage, then, then I, deci I decide what course I'm going to go. And then hopefully I made the right decision. So, so basically, the better the recognition, um, normally the, the, the better the other steps are going to follow. What, what is interesting about this concept is that uh, in general, players, especially, um, I would say, um, more young players, they, they and, and not so well, they, um, when they miss shots, the first thing that comes to mind normally is the shot, is the, is the, is the execution. And that is the last thing that happens. And the more dysfunctional the other, the other six steps are, the more, the more dysfunctional the last step is going to be. So, so the more correct you get your, your, your first six steps, uh, the execution, if you have repeated that sequence enough practicing, uh, is going to be, it's going to be a lot easier. And, but I get the feeling, at least from the, a lot of the players that I work with, is that once again, my backhand is, is, is so bad, I can hit a backhand. And most of the times it happens before that. And that's, uh, once again, that is how I kind of try to use uh, that, that analysis on how the point is played. It's, it's, it's really, really good point because, because you just said it there. I feel, I feel that many times the players and even, even some coaches, they focus on the last step, which is the execution. Right. But right. the problem is, is, is even before that, you don't get to the ball, the balance <laughs> is, is wrong. The decision making, the way that you you uh, the shot selection, the way that you move to the ball because the, the you didn't recognize it uh, very well, the footwork that those problems happen even before the execution. Yes, yes. Okay. So, as I said, I, I think that's uh, is something that is uh, and it, it is very human. I think we all have done that, where uh, where you miss a shot and your first, that's the last thing you do. Right. So so that's the first thing that you remember normally. But and, most of the time, yeah. How 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 you so how you focus on that in practice? How how you work? What what are, what are your your ways or a few of your ways to kind of uh, squeeze on the player on, on that aspect on the eyes and mind? The, 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 yeah yeah the, the, the recognition. The recognition. I, I think every play I think players uh, at, at different levels and in, in different ages and everything they have a um, a feel for the game. You know some people have a much better feel for the game than others. Meaning that some people. Um, um, the recognition is, 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 is better. But um, the one thing I, I want to mention is that it's very difficult to recognize unless you're engaged. 
So, so one of the first rules, one of the non, my non-negotiables is that you get a, is engagement. Without, without paying fully attention, which is what the top players do, it's difficult to take advantage unless the advantage is so obvious that anybody can, can see it. So, so if you play a good player and you give them in, in, in you play, I mean, Roger is the best example, obviously, but if, if basically in general, most of the top players do or all of them. If you give them an inch, they try to take an inch and a quarter. If you give them two inches, they will take three inches. So they're so alert that, that they're not going to get you opportunities by um, uh, and try to get ahead on the point. So, so what I would do with that, uh, what I did a lot when I was, uh, when I was younger, that, that, I, that, I, that I love to hit, um, I mean, I used to do that a lot with the players. So basically, at one point, I helped them. At one point, you start, let's say somebody has a, a little of a hard time um, recognizing when they hit a, a, a pretty good shot. So basically, you got you to gotta play the point together. You cannot hit isolated shots. When you hit a shot and you cut the sequence, then you got to find the ball again. So, so the whole sequence uh, gets cut. So, so I start once again from the beginning uh, progressively. So since I'm hitting with, with him or her, uh, and I can control what I'm, what I'm going to send to the other, to the other side, I'm going to do some, at the beginning, pretty obvious. And then with time, I'm going to challenge the player once again with full engagement, because otherwise it doesn't happen. To, and and I, will actually, um, I will actually encourage uh, the player to make mistakes. So, so he can actually see how it feels to actually go too, too, too fast to the ball and actually confront, confront how, the, how the ball is coming or, or, or waiting too long and see that the ball is, is on, his, his, uh, on his anchors already. So, so with a lot of patience, um, with a lot of patience, but once again, on, on a progressive way, that's normally how, uh, how, how I do it. And, and with, like that with everything. So, so let's say, uh, you know, if somebody, uh, somebody has good recognition, but then doesn't take advantage of the shot. Basically, you know, um, uh, I hit a big back and down the line and the ball comes cross court on the service line. And I kind of, instead of cutting the angle and going forward and taking time away, I go ahead and, and run parallel to the court and, and, and give my, the other player time. So I will do the same thing. I'll start where the things are pretty obvious, where, where obviously the player almost has no choice by actually going diagonally forward or the ball will bounce two times. And then from there, progressively, I'm pushing back more and more. And, and once again, I think I think it's difficult to to learn without failing, and I think it's one of the that's one of the mistakes that we make in in, in, in today's world. Um, but I think we try to have the kids too much, and, and we don't give them a chance to actually fail and try to and try to solve that problem. Because at the end of the day, they, they are problems every time the ball comes to, the, to to your side. So so once again, I, I kind of follow that you know the progressions, and uh, and and then from there. I just go and, and, and as far as I can go with them. That's uh, awesome. I mean, it's very, very clear. I, I like, I like what you just say about about connecting the sequence. Yes. Uh, you, as, as soon as you break that sequence, then you have to find the ball again. That's that's a great, great concept. And I mean, so, uh, Diego, uh, so, sorry, sorry for a second. So, how many times have, uh, for for us coaches, how many times have we been coaching somebody, watching a match, and actually, and actually? The player hits the ball and you start going forward, and, and you see the player staying back. How many times does that happen? A lot of times. So, yeah. so you know what I'm saying? So, so basically, you're reading the shot actually better than the than the player that is playing, and that doesn't happen with the top players. The top players normally that's why they make the game look so easy, because they actually make the right moves very. They constantly. play. They play one or two shots ahead, and yes. that, that makes the, the sequence. They understand the sequence and how how to connect the shots. Yeah, um, yes. Diagonals. So we know and we talk, uh, the, and it's, it's a little bit along uh, what you just say. Uh, diagonals. The, the, the top players, they never play three shot moving parallel to the line. They always give ground or take <laughs> ground, like you say. You give him one, one quarter, they, they take oh, one, yeah. a, a one and, and a quarter. You, they, they, you give them two, they take three. Um, but, but we see. I see at some point, at some level, a lot of players that they start like they start having afraid of, of jamming their serve, you know, like crashing too fast to the ball and, and make that mistake. So so as a result of that, they they decide to wait for the ball, let it drop, and make sure that they, they make a good contact with the ball. How Jose Guerras deal with that? How how you help that player to play a, a world class level? 
Okay. So once again, I will start with progressions also. So uh, a good progression for that is not, is not diagonal, but it's a little bit, uh, you can call it, for example, a very simple drill. You go, you play cross court forehands. Cross court forehands and you ask the player, I want you to go down the line as much as you can, but you got to be in top of the baseline or inside. So, so when you tell them that, automatically, automatically, if they hit up, and then you ask the other player on the other side, you play your shots normal. So, so, so that's a little more advanced. But for example, if I'm hitting with him or her, I would say, okay, you take every ball that you can down the line, pretty offensive, pretty offensive, but you have to be on top of the baseline or you have to be inside the court. So, so as I hit with the player at the beginning, I will, I will, I will make it very random. So I will give them a lot of the opportunities to actually see the ball coming with enough time and so on and so on. As we progress on that, I will get another player and I will have him do the same thing. Um, what happened with that, if you, you, you gotta be 100% engaged in terms of your shot and in terms of your position to be able to take advantage of that. And obviously when you do a drill like that, that is a pretty simple drill, like a lot of the things that, a lot of the drills that, that I like to do. Um, when you do a drill like that and you hit a ball that you feel that goes deep into the, into the baseline, um, you're going to take a better position. So if the ball doesn't come short, you, you still you go back again. But the sequence of the play is always playing. But the whole idea is to allow the kids to make mistakes. That, that, that's my feeling. So, so I will encourage them to actually uh, feel how it feels doing it right and also how it feels when they actually go too fast to the ball. So don't so, panic. Basically, don't panic when, when, when they jump to the ball and then they, no. they feel that they didn't find it well. Don't panic. Just, just understand that it's a process it, until, until you start finding it, that ball. It, yes, because the danger, is, the, the danger normally is when you play a ball too offensive that is not there to be offensive, you make a mistake. So, so that's the punishment that you get. Well, if you let the, the opportunity go by, you may get another opportunity. You may not. But you may get another opportunity. So, so that's why I think is is uh, I think it's important uh, to give the player that that uh, leeway for 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 him or her to actually make make the decision because at the end of the day they are the ones that are playing the decision. Sometimes you you be playing a match uh, and you will let more opportunities go by for a reason because you because you want to stay on that floor because you know you're gonna get an error because your footwork doesn't feel sharp because you don't see that you you're not as uh, your feel is not a good that day so. When we talk about on, in, on absolutes with the players, then, then we don't give them that room to make their own decisions, which I think, which I think is so important because at the, at the end of the day, they are the ones that are going to play and, and, and do that. Correct. Correct. Excellent. Excellent. Jose. Um, two more questions about, about you and, and kind of your, your philosophy. Um, we were talking like a few years ago, more than, more than six years ago, I, I believe, and, and I, I was like trying to explain what was my work with one of the players that I, I was working at that time and, and the, the stages. And you say, Diego, uh, it's time in my mind, you say, Diego, uh, we work on everything all the time. Yes. yes. So it was amazing because, because I, I don't know if you remember, we were at dinner in New York and I said, yeah. how, I mean, but, but you don't get how you work and you say, well, you have to be engaged and you have to pay attention. Can, can, you, can you go over uh, that concept of we work on everything all the time as coaches? Yes. I mean, this is, um, I mean, no, normally, once again, it, it, it comes with engagement. I mean, I mean when, I, when I'm on the tennis court, and I think you, you know me well, when I'm on the tennis court, I'm on the tennis court. And I, and I pay attention to everything that happens because it, that's, that's what I do. And, and I cannot expect the player to have that mindset if I don't have that mindset. So, so I cannot ask once again. I will not, never ask a player to do something that I'm not that I'm not gonna that I'm not doing. So, in order for me to uh, let's say somebody we're working on the backhand slice, for example, uh, I'm gonna pay attention to the, to the forehand. I'm gonna pay attention to his foot. I'll pay attention to everything, independently if I'm if I'm actually working on something specific with the player, because because uh, otherwise it's like uh, I don't know. It's like uh, uh, like you have dinner. You have dinner and you're. You say, well, you know, this week I'm gonna eat dessert every day, because I wanna because I wanna get my sugar higher or whatever it is, and then and then, uh, but what happened with the other two courses? Yeah, I, I mean, so so basically, basically, um, I think I think the game of tennis. Is
the higher the level, the more detail oriented it is. Uh, not, not that it's not detail oriented at all, at all stages. Uh, so, so, so for, for me, it's a must. I, actually, I, I see a few people say, well, Jose, you, you see everything. N not really. I mean, I, 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 I look for everything. Not necessarily I'm going to see everything, but I always, I'm always looking. Um, in terms of how the player is playing independently of, of what the focus of the practice is. Excellent. Excellent. One more of that. Um, never bad practices. <laughs> I, I, love the, I love that because it's, it's true. Um, I, know, I know you and, and uh, coming along with the engagement, uh, every time that you step on court, you, you squeeze the player um, as much as you, as you possibly can. Uh, and it's true. Uh, can you, but but if somebody doesn't know you, uh, when you say I, I never have I never have bad practices, what what that means? What why why that statement? I mean I mean to me a bad practice. I don't measure practice about how well you play, because I think you're gonna play a lot of different levels through the year. So it would be it wouldn't be fair for me to judge your practice. Yes, if you play well, we had a great practice. If you didn't play well, we had a horrible practice. So, so I measure the practices by, uh, by uh, engagement and effort because I, because I believe that you get better. If you have the worst tennis day in, in, of the month and you're actually engaged and you're actually and the effort is there, I believe that you get better. So, so uh, that's how I measure practice. That, that's why I say for me the only practice is bad practice. First of all, if there is no engagement, I probably won't practice or I will cut the practice short. Because I don't, I don't believe I'm helping the player, and I'm wasting my time also. So, so, so basically, I don't think I'm, I'm serving the player well when I have him on the court just to just to cover four hours or three hours or whatever time it is. So, so when I say uh, I don't have bad practices, uh, once again, I want to make clear it's not about how you play, because if I if I tell you you or or, or I, I mean one of the most rewarding things of, of, of my playing career when I was playing, uh, at least at the moment, was when I was matches playing pretty poorly. And, and, and I just found ways to, to, actually, to actually win those matches. So it's the same thing. You cannot do that unless you're fully engaged and fully committed. So if you, if you, are, if you are committed and the effort is there and the engagement is there, uh, I'll have you on my call. I can care less if every ball goes on the fence, if I see that that engagement and that effort is there. And I think you, I think you, you'll be better. Um, and I, I believe that's how the top players practice. Yeah. It's not a, not about the quantity, but about about the about the effort that they put into the practices, and then they make it last as long as as long as they feel it's productive. Excellent, excellent. I I I, I, yeah, I completely agree with with, with that. It's a, it's a perfect and very very clear uh, path to to handle the practices. Um, Jose, uh, now we're gonna go to the. Jose more um, So you start with any player. Doesn't matter the name, doesn't matter the age. You start with the player. What what Jose look at the first? What, what is on top of your checklist? So when you start with the player, how you start? What you look for? Well, um, I mean, I, I mean, I wouldn't start with a, I wouldn't go on call with anybody before there is a, 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 an understanding of what what we're doing, what, what we want to do. So basically, I will sit down for, with this player and I will ask him what, uh, what uh, his or her uh, goals are. Um, because maybe if, if her or his goals are um, not mine, then, then obviously that's not going to work. So I, I start by having a very frank and honest conversation about what, what, how much they like to play, what they want to do with their, with their game, and so on and so on. If all those things are good, then, then we go then we go a little bit more into into uh, into how I do things, uh, like you and you know. For example, I have some uh, some non-negotiables that that doesn't mean that they are non-negotiables uh, 100%. But I, I will only go down so so much with it for a period of time. So uh, which are you gotta be on time because I'm gonna be on time, and uh, you're gonna re you're gonna have respect for your peers and your and everybody like uh, like we do. Um, it's going to be a full effort and, and full engagement. So once we have that talk, if, uh, if, if, if the player, because the, one of the things that, that I learned by making a mistake, when I started coaching, um, I don't like the player to come and say, well, Jose, you didn't tell me that. You didn't tell me that I had to be on time. Or you didn't tell me that 
I had to try. I didn't tell me, no, we, we get everything out and then at the end of the conversation, if we agree with that, if we agree, we'll start the, the, uh, the relationship. If we don't, we'll stay friends the same way. But, uh, but it's important to, 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 to kind of understand and know what, what are everybody's, everybody's intentions and goals with the, uh, with the relationship. That, that, was the, that would be the first thing. Uh, if you want to go into the, te into the yes. tennis part of that. What, well, what happened with the tennis? Yeah, into the, ten, into the tennis side, uh, I, I like to, um, if I don't know the player, but most of the times I actually, uh, I have actually known the players that I work with, not from coaching, but just from sitting before. Um, I'll, I'll ask them how they feel about the game, how, how they see the game, that kind of like to be the input. Um, I see them play, and then from there we make a plan. We make a plan that is not a, it's not we're going to win Wimbledon next week. We make, we make a short-term a short plan, which normally is a, once again, doing the daily work that happens all the time. And then uh, looking at his game or her game, uh, we see where he's lacking and we see where his uh, or her uh, weapons are. And from there, we start developing to try to make it the, the most complete player possible and the better player possible. And that normally takes, uh, it takes time, especially when you want to try to add um, some things to, to, to the game where, uh, where, where it takes time and, uh, and there are some periods of a little bit insecurity with, with those things. So once again, I try to use um, the same progressions, you know, according to, um, there are some players that, uh, that will take the information a lot better and they assimilate things a lot better than others. So, so I'm always, I always try to be aware of that. Uh, for example, I'll give you, I'll give you an example. Um, um, you know, Michael Chang, for example, and that was a long time ago. Michael Chang uh, had a great ability to assimilate. I mean, you, you, you tell him to do something, uh, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't do it right away, but the next day he'll come back and he'll actually do it pretty well. So, and then you get this, another player on the same group, and, uh, and it took him or her, you know, a month and a half or two months to get to that, to that place. So I think that's something important to, to, keep, in, to keep in mind. But I, I think it's important for the player, a couple of, th couple of things. One, uh, they got to know and they got to feel that you're there for them. Um, I think that that's extremely important. Um, they got to know why, if, they, if you're going to judge them, why are you going to judge them for? M meaning that, once again, I cannot just get mad at somebody because they lose, because everybody loses. And if the kid goes out there and, and, and has been working well, practicing well. Now, another, another thing that I, will, that I will mention is, most of the times I will judge the players, especially at young ages, uh, because it happens a lot more often, on their decision making. When they play, not in, not in, a, in a negative way, but in, on a teachable way. So, so if they play, they are at 4 or 30 old, and all of a sudden they, they do something they haven't done during the whole first set, meaning something ridiculous short, something, or they didn't take advantage of a ball like that. So those are reminders that, that with time, you know, you start to give them the security of, uh, of, of knowing that you're there for them. And, uh, and, uh, and, that, and, and I think that's a great, it's a great thing for the athlete. One of the main, the main uh, things that you believe is on, the, on those, on those uh, we, call, we call the two areas of focus, the, the, the two yeah. tenets that you you every single day, and you are one of the most consistent coaches that I, I ever seen doing that. Uh, the religiously, Every, the 20 minutes of the two areas that you recognize uh, uh, with the player that, that he or she has to work on, every yes. day you put those, those 20 minutes on, yes. on those two areas, right? So that's, uh, that's one of the main, the main things that you, every day, you, you keep doing. Yeah, no, normally, if I, once, once again, once uh, I spend, uh, um, I have a relationship with the player and we make a plan and, and I look at his game or her game, and I think, okay, I'm going to take two things uh, that I think uh, is going to make a, a, a pretty big impact if, I can, if, if we can get them back, if we can get them to a, to a, to a decent level. Um, so, for example, if, if I'm working with somebody that, uh, that doesn't have a backhand slice at all, uh, well, more than likely, his backhand ball is not going to be that good either. So if I close my eyes and I see this kid play, uh, a year from now, two years from now, which is what I do actually a lot of times when I work with players, I kind of close my eyes and see how I, will, how I see them going forward or, or in two years. Um, then obviously that's conveyed to the player. Um, you don't get better without uh, doing enough repetitions. 
uh, in our repetition with engagement. So, so I think if, I mean, I, I think, it, and I've, I saw some of the old players do that also in, years ago, uh, straight from the, from the match score to the practice score. And uh, so I figured, okay, if you take 20 minutes a day, and, and actually during the practice, you're still working on the same things as we were saying before. So, so, so if I'm working on, on a back and volley or four and volley, it doesn't mean that when they hit four and volleys or back and volleys in the uh, practice, I'm, I'm not going to pay attention to that. But I'm going to take 20 minutes and I'm going to... Uh, so, so I'm going to take, take 20 minutes every day, no matter what, especially with, uh, with young kids. It's a good discipline tool for the kids. And, and, it's, and, and it takes some pressure away from them also, because at the end of the day, it's about getting better. And the whole idea is it's about getting better. And, that, and that's the fun of playing. So uh, I'll tell you a funny story with, uh, with uh, I mean, Jim, you know, Jim was, uh, I mean, with the best professional I worked with. He was absolutely unbelievable. And uh, he was playing the, the um, he, was, he played the French, the French Open semifinals, I believe. It finished very late at night. And you know that at the French Open, they covered the courts. Uh, he, he played on Senate court. He, was, he played Michael Stitch, I believe. And uh, so anyway, so when we finished, uh, all the courts were covered. And, uh, and, Jim, and Jim, I mean, he was about, about as intense as you've seen anybody. So we go there, and I go get some balls, you know, and we're going to hit some more. And he played, he played, I believe, four or five sets. So I go get some balls, and I go, gee, there's no court. So, so we go to court two, and they say, no, 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 no es posible, no es posible. Well, Jim, Jim got the, uh, uh, the plastic, you know, those big plastic things. <laughs> and, then, and then the crew came and said, no, no, we'll, we'll uncover you, we'll uncover you. My point is, that's how much he believed that that, that was good for him. And, and I think, once again, it's a, it's a good discipline, you know, for the kids, and it gets better. If you do, in 20 minutes, if you divide it 10 and 10 minutes for uh, – for those two, two things that you tend to work on, seconds or whatever it is, and you do 25, 30 repetitions with your mind into it, you count the amount of repetitions at the end of the year. It's impossible, it's not going to get better. Uh, or we'll be the first person that'll say that it didn't get better. But it takes the discipline from the, from the, from the coach and the player, uh, and for the coach especially to convince the player that that's, that that's a, good, a good way for him to get better. And, and it takes, it, it's true, it's completely true, it takes the pressure uh, of the player in terms of the outcome of the match. It doesn't matter yes. if you win or lose, you get, we're going to keep improving, and that's, that's yes. what the focus should be. It, yeah, Perfect. because if you, if you get better, you will win more. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you can worry about winning all you want to, but if your back and sucks, they're going to exploit the next match and the next match and the next match. So, so at the end of the day, it's all about getting better in all areas, you know, mental, <laughs> physical, and tennis. Jose, um, I'm gonna go years back, and uh, you, you went. You went. The, the question you went ahead. Um, I want to know. Uh, I want you to tell me about about when you start with Jim. We're gonna yes. talk about Jim. We're gonna talk about Roger, and we're gonna talk about uh, the moments where you receive players like Chang Sampras in in Palm Springs yes. back on the day. But let's start with the with the first one with Jim. You receive Jim. Uh, what players did you receive? How how you build the plan, and how how you proceed? I mean, after that, how how was the plan? How how you yeah. how you did all the job? I, I believe that you you uh, worked with him seven years, right? Yeah, I worked with him eight years, I believe. Seven eight years. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So how how was how was the the beginning of that relationship? Well, uh, the beginning was that I was having dinner one night and my phone rang in 1990, and uh, I believe it was in uh, September or October, and uh, Picard Penn said, hello, and he goes, hi, this is Jim Courier. Uh, I said, what, well, Jim? I, I didn't know Jim that much. I mean, I just knew him from, uh, from uh, watching play some time, but I didn't really have a relationship with him. And, and he said, uh, he said, well, I said, well, I can help you, Jim. I said, well, I think, uh, I think, um, I think you can help me, and I was, I was, uh, I was hoping that you could help me, if you can coach me. And I said, well, um, it kind of caught me by surprise, to be honest with you. But uh, at the time, I was, I was still working uh, uh, for the USDA uh, as a part-time, you know, for 25 weeks a year. So I told Jim, I said, listen, I have a... Uh... Oh, we get, we get a little... Like, I don't know what happened with... Uh, there it is. Yeah. 
sorry. Yeah. I think, I think I'm running, I'm running low on battery. That's the thing. But anyway, but, uh, but uh, so anyway, so, so that's what so I talked to the SDA. They say absolutely. And Jim was a pretty good player already. He was like 30 or 35 in the world. So, uh, so he came to Palm Springs in October. We spent until he went to Australia. And uh, so we went to the same, to the same, uh, same thing that, that we talked about before. Uh, I didn't know Jim at all. So it took me a little time to, uh, to, to know him. Once I kind of uh, had a little better understanding uh, about, about him, about his personality, his desire, uh, some of the, a little, slowly I kind of got an idea of some of the things, not only, um, not only tennis-wise, but most important, uh, mind-wise also, uh, not to do with his desire, but how uh, level of anxiety when, when you play and so on and so on, which, which sometimes it happens because you want to, to win so bad that, uh, that it doesn't allow you to actually play relax enough to, to be able to function. So, uh, so we spent two and a half months together, in fact, between him and I, morning and afternoon, and, uh, and then we started, we started working on, on his game. Uh, the first thing was he had a huge... Go ahead, Diego. No, no, no. What was... Exactly. That was the, yeah. the, 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 on his game, what are the things that you recognize that immediately yeah. he to get better? Yeah, see, he had a, uh, he had a, 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 big, a big for him. A big forehand, good serve, uh, you know, an, an adequate backhand, uh, volleys and uh, backhand slice very poor, uh, volleys pretty poor. So, 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 so basically, so basically, um, um, I, I said, how, how can we get the most out of this forehand? That will be the first thing. Um, that will come with core position. And with, uh, and with making the right decision, depending on you are on the court. Uh, then how can we make, how can we take more advantage of that shot by actually getting some things better? So the first thing that came to mind for me was, okay, you got to take more balls in the air. Uh, to take more balls in the air, his volleys need to, need to be a little better. So that was, that was, that was pretty much the first thing. The same thing, if, if, he, if he improved his backhand slice, he's going to be able to, since he got to end the backhand, um, He's going to be able to defend more. He's going to be able to save some balls. Um, and at the same time, his partner's slice is going to get better too, which is going to help also when he takes some balls out of the air. So, uh, so, so that's pretty much, uh, that's pretty much what, um, what that was the beginning of that. And then from there, from there, yes, yes progressively, um, as, as those things got better, he became a better tennis player because, because he would take, he would, and that took time. It didn't happen. It didn't happen in two months or three months. It, ha it, it happened with time. And, uh, but always given the freedom, actually, to, to uh, we, we practice, we practice, we practice, but I never forced him to do anything on court when he was playing. I mean, I always give him the option and then he'd use it accordingly. And, and that's the freedom that I think the players, the, the, you know, the players um, go ahead. So, so basically that, that, was, that was how we, how we started. Um, as, as he, uh, for example, one thing uh, when Jim, uh, when he played Wimbledon the first time, when I was with him, um, he used to seven volley first and second serve. Because I was, uh, in those days, he still, the, the grass wasn't, but it wasn't as, 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 uh, as fast as it was 10 years before that. Right. So it, with his volleys not, not, being, not being very sharp at the time, um, and he's not a natural seven volley, so we make a decision that he was going to seven volley occasionally, but he was going to actually go to the net with more advantage um, after the first ball, if he had a chance, so that, so he started to do that. And actually, for me, if I look at my time with Jim, that was one of the most rewarding things for him for, when he got to the finals of Wimbledon, um, because he beat he beat some some really good grass court players, and uh, and lost to Pete, which uh, which actually one of the best grass court players ever on, on a very good match in the finals. So so basically, once again, it, it's about just keep finding ways, finding ways to maximize um, what the players have. And then keep adding, keep adding because one at one point or another in matches you're gonna need some of those things. You're gonna need to stretch and, and, and actually try to save a ball with the backhand slice. And maybe the ball goes there with nothing, but you get a bad bounce and you win the point. So so so, so just keep adding, keep adding, and, and, and try to keep getting better. And Jim always took that to to heart, you know. And he, uh, um, I always trusted, I always trusted his uh, his approach to, to to what he did. And, uh, and and I believe he trusted he trusted me, so it was a good. Right. No, uh, amazing, amazing partnership. I mean, you guys, you did an amazing job. Um, now, a uh, couple of years 
after that uh, you build, uh, you start working with with Roger. So um, can you can you kind of go over over that when you start with Roger? Um, I believe that your first tournament was a story. I don't remember what what tournament was that, but a little bit. What what did you see on on him at that time? That was like yes. two years back. And and how you build the plan and how was the how was the beginning and and the fo your focus? Well, with, with Roger, with Roger, um, when Roger when I started working with him, I, I got a call from Tony, from Tony uh, Godsick, and I think it happened also because I spent time with. Um, I used to coach Mary Jo Fernandez. Mary Jo was my first, uh, my, my first client, if you want to call it like that, because she's a very good friend and a wonderful lady. Um, and, um, and, and anyway, so I said, hey, uh, you, you know, Roger, uh, he was coming back from a, um, from a, uh, a mononucleosis uh, and, and his body was still not uh, in the best shape. And anyway, make a story short, um, I, I had a, I had a, Roger picked up the phone and uh, I said, hi, Jose, this is Roger, blah, blah. So the first thing he asked me, he says, uh, uh, well, Jose, what do you think about my game? And I said, well, not much. Kind of joking, obviously. <laughs> uh, so uh, so basically, uh, I went to Surreal. Uh, I didn't really, um, I, I watched some tapes. We, we watched a bunch of tapes the, day, the, uh, the night that I got there. And, uh, and, uh, and I, th I had some ideas on things that I thought uh, he could get better. Uh, to maximize everything great that he does. And one of those was, um, you know, his back. And I thought uh, when, when somebody played a high to his back and his, uh, uh, he got caught enough uh, where the ball was, was, was too high. Uh, so his football needed other, you need to go back or you need to actually go forward and take the ball at shoulder high so you have some leverage with the shot. Uh, and then the other thing, um, the other thing that I thought he could volley more. He, he was a very capable volleyer and I, I didn't think he, um, he, he went to the to net to the enough. Um, interesting thing with uh, with Roger is uh, obviously he's got a great tennis mind, um, but he's always he's always exploring to to get better and to and to uh, and to and to try things that on his mind you know make sense. Uh, for example, in uh, before I started working with him, we watched a bunch of tapes once again, and I never saw him hit a. Um, I never saw him, saw him hit a, a, a forehand drop shot. So I asked him, I said, Roger, why, why would you hit a forehand drop? Why you, you don't hit forehand drop shot? He said, well, why would I do that? I have a huge forehand. So, um, so I explained him, if you play a, a good retriever like Rafa or uh, any of the Spanish guys or somebody that retrieves well, uh, the drop shot is a very offensive shot. So I said, when you have a ball in the middle of the court uh, and the other player is somewhat beat, uh, if you don't have a drop shot, you have two shots. You have the down the line and you have the off the court shot to, to actually try to hit a winner. Um, if you have the drop shot, you have three. And the difference is that when you have the drop shot uh, and, you, and you hit it a few times, even if you don't win the point, uh, psychologically worse on the other player when you get balls like that. Their position is going to be a little different. And it, it just make a long story short. Um, uh, it's not easy to teach anything to those guys because they are so good. So, so really, so really, it's not that that you're gonna go and invent anything. But uh, we went out the next day, and he started hitting some drop shots. And two days later, he was in a drop shot because he can actually assimilate things uh, like, like, like nobody. So, so, so that was that was my. Uh, and then through the year, uh, through the year, um, he got to the finals of Wimbledon, lost to Rafa in a, in a five set, a tough match. And then um, his body started; he was getting in better shape slowly um and then the summer came didn't have a great summer um in, in before the u.s open but then he, he went ahead and won the u.s open and and for example um you know talking about players uh not telling players what to do like for example with roger we we used to spend time you know on his volleys coming forward you know and, and kind of try to emphasize that um well the first four or five rounds that he played um, he didn't come to the net much at all. If you watch the, if you watch the, uh, the semifinals and finals with uh, Djokovic and, um, and Murray, uh, he came to the net one over 40 times and the other one over 35. So, so my point is that uh, you do the work, uh, you give the players the freedom to actually do it as they feel like it, but, but obviously there's got to be some expectation that they got to actually do something. Yes. 
and, and that comes to a, to, a, to a great story from one of my, uh, one of my heroes, or, which is uh, Rod Laver. He used to live in Palm Springs, and, um, and I used to see him, have lunch with him often. And anyway, so one day we were having lunch, and, and that was the year that Jim became number one. And he said, um, he said Jose, what, what, what do you guys do with Jim? What do you guys work on? And I said, well, I told him the same thing. I said, I'm trying for him to take some more balls in the air. You know, the, the point resets too much during matches and so on and so on. So he said, what, how is he doing? And I said, well, um, it's a fight because it's, it's tough when you compete at that level to actually, to actually take those steps to, to do things that you're not, um, that are disciplined and so on. And he said, well, how is he doing? I said, well, it's a fight. So he said, well, just, take him, just tell him to, to take the ones he likes, but he's got to like some, which I thought it, it was a great, it was a great, uh, it was a great quote. And that's something that I use with uh, with a lot of the kids that, that I work with. Yeah, that's that's a great quote. You 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 told me that quote, and I, I, I keep it I keep it for for me. I mean, that's uh go, going on on that direction. I mean, we do the work, but yes. uh, at some point the player has to go that direction as he as he. Yes. Does. Yes. Jose, the the time is is, is flying. I am really enjoying the the, the talk. So um, I'm gonna skip a couple of questions and I'm gonna go yes. through. Uh, <laughs> Two or three more. Um, think about one or two things of all all the years of experience. One or two things that you really like or about your job. Don't tell me the player. Don't tell me the. But two or three things that you really like about your job. So what would be James uh, improving James uh, okay. net game, for example? I, I will imagine. Yeah, I mean, I. I, I... I don't, I don't really think that is one particular uh, player. The, the, the thing that I love, that I really love about my job and the day that I don't feel that way, I will, I will not do it anymore, is that um, I, I love tennis. I mean, tennis that, that's been my, has been my life uh, since I was only a kid. Um, it has been great to me, uh, not only in terms of being able to, uh, to provide for my family and everything, but also, but also with the amount of people that I have met, the amount of experiences that I have had. So... So for me, it's actually a privilege if I have a chance to go on the court with somebody that wants to try and has the desire of getting better, um, I, I don't really care that much how good they are, to be honest. I love to work with beginners. I don't care. Uh, but, but, uh, but for me to maintain that excitement, which is really what drives me to, to get up in the morning and go on court and do that, uh, and being fully engaged and be on time and, and go through all that, uh, I mean, that's my reward. I think uh, the, the more... Um, the more time I, I, I can do that, um, that's, that's, that's payback because I really love the game. Yeah, yeah, perfect. And now, now I'm going to go to Bert. So yes. tell me one or two things that you say on all the years that you say, well, I didn't like what I did there. I mean, I could do a better job or, or, or my job there, I didn't like my job. One or two things do do you have? Maybe maybe you don't have, but well, um, I, I mean, I, I've been lucky. I've been I've been lucky in my coaching career that I was I've been always pretty independent, meaning that I was able to always make the decisions that I felt that that, that were the right decisions to make without worry about consequences. Consequences meaning getting fired or stop working with the player. So, so so that was that was always an advantage. The the thing that maybe uh. I didn't like as time went on is that the influence of uh, people outside of the player circle. Uh, the people, for example, when I, start, when I was working with, uh, when I was coaching like that, um, uh, I mean, I was in charge of the player and, and, uh, and it was understood. And now I think there is quite a few more forces pulling from the kids, which it makes our job a lot tougher. And that's something that, that's something that I, have a, I have, sometimes I have a hard time coping with. Because I don't believe it's in the best interest of the player. That, that's the only reason. So, so if I, besides that, um, um, besides that, I made my my um, uh, my share of uh, of mistakes uh, uh, through my career, like uh, I believe it, it, m most coaches do. Uh, but I always try to learn from them. And uh, and and uh, if I made the same mistakes two times in a row, then then I lose some, then I, I lose some sleep over it. You know? so, <laughs> Yeah. But, but, but I think what I see the kids these days, the young kids, 
uh, with that much, that, much, that much pressure, outside pressure, uh, at young ages, that, that is something that, that makes me feel because I, I think it takes, it takes quite a bit of the enjoyment of, 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 playing, the, of playing tennis. Yeah. And, and, and I think that that's something that it makes me a little sad, but um, I guess there are the times. Jose, w one last question, and then, sure. and then uh, we, we're going we're gonna to finish. Um, where the tennis is going, in your opinion? So what are the next five years, ten years, they're going to look like? And, and uh, what is the next improvement in tennis? You know, I, th I think uh, I think it's gonna go in the same direction that it's going now, but faster. I, I think uh, the athletes are gonna get better. Uh, people are gonna hit the ball bigger. Um, the players are gonna become more complete. I think uh, with time, you're gonna see people that are gonna be able to do everything. Now they're gonna be able to do everything, maybe not uh, as as well as uh, the number one in the world, but you, you're not gonna see very poor volleys. You're not gonna see people with really bad back and slices. You're not gonna see people with big holes in their games, which I think they still, they, they still are there. The other thing, I believe that the, uh, that the net is underplayed. Uh, I think the net is a, is a form of pressure, like any other pressure that you can put in your opponent. And uh, because of the trend of the game in the last uh, X amount of years with the slowing of the course and everything, we, we, we don't practice enough. So we, we don't know that area of the core uh, as much as we wanted to. But I think, I think if you look at... Uh, if you look at, 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 the, uh, at the game today on the men's and the women's side, I think you can see that players are becoming more complete. And I think that is a, that is a trend that uh, once, once, uh, once people are not uh, so much in a hurry, that I, that I say, but to try to, uh, to master more skills and give them some, a, little, a little longer time to actually, to actually for the games to mature, um, I, I think you're going to see... Um, it's going to get better. It's going to get better in all aspects. The people have more help, uh, certain conditioning, you know, mental side. The coaching is getting better all the time. Um, but, but I believe that's one of my, one of my things I'm hoping. Uh, I'm, and actually, the percentages, when you look at the percentages of, uh, of, point, of points once at the net, it's pretty good in general. It's pretty good. Now, now, obviously, you cannot just chip and charge consistently like, like in the old days or, or go with an approach shot that is not... So you've got to go with more advantage to the net. But if you go with more advantage, uh, when, when, uh, when, the, when the match is close, I, I think uh, if you have the skill at the net, I think it's a good place to be too. It's going to be there, yeah. yeah. I, I, believe, I believe so because um, it's becoming so, uh, so physical right now. Everybody's moving so well, yeah. not missing balls, that... Um, that I think I think the net is is gonna is gonna come back to be one of yeah. the even even with the courts slower as, as yeah. uh, the courts are right now, uh, but it's gonna be the area that is gonna come back to the game uh, because the players I, I I completely agree with you they have they're gonna have to be more complete. Yes. So so that's uh, that's I think is the. I mean, you have players like uh, like I said, Roger is more of a is a lot more natural volleyer than, than Rafa and, and, and Novak. But Rafa, I mean, Rafa is a good volleyer. Yeah. I mean, I mean, Rafa also missed too many easy volleys, and and Djokovic has improved his volleys a lot also. Has improved his backhand slice. So, so once again, I, th I think with time, um, with time we're gonna see more. If you look at the women's side, you see more backhand slices, yeah. you see more drop shots. Uh, at the U.S. Open, you see some girls actually serving on volleying. So, so uh, I believe that that uh, that uh, everything gets better, and I think I think that will get better too. Perfect, Jose. We have one one more minute, so uh, right. I want I want to thank you so much. Um, I, I know that I took I took you a little bit out of your comfort zone, taking on on the Instagram. Uh, yeah. But but I think I think I really I really enjoy. Hope hope you enjoy this this conversation, and hope that people that, that yeah. they listen, um, uh, they they enjoy it as well. It's gonna be. Uh, this is gonna is recorded, so so you, they can oh, watch good. it again. But it was amazing. I mean, it was it was really good. I hope, you. hope you enjoy it. And uh, and talk to you soon, Jose. Thank you so much. Okay. And have a great weekend. Thank you, Diego. And be safe. Everybody, be safe. Bye. Thank you too. You. Bye, Jose. Bye, bye.